One of the questions I am frequently asked in historical costume is, aren't you cold? And the truth is, no, usually I'm not. Victorian clothing in particular consists of so many layers that it's very easy to adapt to different temperatures, and, at least for the temperature range that I get here in England, I don't really need any special clothing for most activities. The outfit starts with the chemise, mine are made from old sheets that have been washed many times so they're as soft as possible, and stockings. These are modern over-the-knee socks, and while patterned stockings are accurate for the 1880s, if there's one thing I would change it would be to swap these for knitted woolen socks, as my feet were a little cold. The next layer is the corset. This corset is the heaviest one I own, a modern overbust made of several layers of heavy fabric, and while I usually go for something much lighter, any corset provides an excellent protective layer around your core, which helps warm your entire body. Next on are the drawers. As you can see they're open down the centre, and no, there isn't a draught. I've occasionally swapped them for fully closed bloomers and I have never noticed a difference. My chemise and drawers are made of cotton and are very voluminous, but knitted woolen versions also existed if you need more warmth. The cage bustle goes on next. Mine is far too fancy compared to a period accurate example, but I enjoy it. This doesn't really do anything for or against keeping warm, but it is essential for the 1880s shape. Something like a large crinoline which would hold your petticoats away from your legs might have more of an effect. You do see people wearing warm petticoats under their crinolines for this reason, but often the air that gets trapped inside the spaces inside your support garments warms up and acts as insulation unless it's disturbed by a cold breeze. Then it's time for petticoats. I typically only wear one or two, as too many petticoats tend to flatten the bustle and change the silhouette, but for very cold weather we make compromises. The first one is the fullest and fluffiest, and actually not intended for wearing with a bustle, but nobody will ever know that it's higher at the back than at the front. The second petticoat is made to a bustle silhouette with a flat front and a ribbon inside the back to control the fullness. Both of these are just regular cotton or poly cotton. Again, the level of detail and pattern is not period, but is extremely fun. But the dense ruffles and folds of fabric still trap warm air and help insulate the body. The final underskirt is actually a silk skirt for an early 1880s evening dress, so it struggles with all this volume, but silk is an extremely good insulator for its weight. If it's possible to add a silk layer to your ensemble for warmth, I very much recommend it. Finally, a corset cover smooths out all the lines of the undergarments and adds an extra layer to warm your core. I do have lighter and more finely made corset covers. This one is of a quite a heavy cotton fabric, was intended as an outer layer I could wear with an underbust corset underneath if I had to be in public in my underwear. Hashtag LARP problems. But since we are going for maximum layers, this one it is. If I was going to be staying inside, I would probably go for my tea gown. This is made entirely of heavy silk brocade, which is ridiculously warm. It fits closely around my neck and wrists, a very basic technique you'll also see employed by modern technical clothing to trap heat around the body. The fact that the skirts sweep the floor also helps create an enclosed space full of warm air, as it's harder for cold drafts to get through.
The only additional layer I've ever felt needed here were a pair of fingerless gloves, and these are very optional. However, a tea gown is somewhat inappropriate to go places in, so for an outdoor excursion I am instead going to wear a directoire ensemble. The black fabric here is polyester satin, and the orange is a very fine silk. And the costume is made of two pieces, a skirt and a trained bodice styled to look like a shirt and coat. Polyester is a pretty good insulator when it's this thick, although it is bulkier and less breathable than the silk. While I didn't specifically make this as a very cold weather outfit, having a silk bodice and polyester skirt rather than the other way around is a smart move in terms of warmth, as the skirt both has more layers and your legs are less important. Sorry legs. If we are going to go outside, it's worth noting that my fingers and ears remain exposed, and we still had the problems of wind and rain. Not that rain is an issue on this particular day. Coats to fit over bustle gowns did exist, but equally so did wraps and cloaks. I find people often misjudge cloaks, assuming they serve the same purpose as a modern coat. But a cloak is not meant to be your primary source of warmth. Cloaks do provide insulation, but their main role is to prevent wind and precipitation from making contact with the body and the body's warm layers. And they actually do this best by hanging away from the body than fitting closely to it, like coat does. Now that we're all ready, time to see what the great outdoors has to offer. For reference, this day was a balmy minus 2 to minus 4 degrees Celsius with very little wind and freshly fallen, or rather falling, snow. So far from the coldest it can get in the UK and far from how miserable it could have been with heavy rain or older snow, but equally none of these clothes were specifically designed for cold weather and I was very comfortable in all three versions. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to keep the YouTube gods happy. Follow me on Instagram, and in the description box there's a link to my Kofi if you'd like to make a one-off donation to support this channel and help me get a replacement pair of cozy winter boots now I actually have to go outside again. Seriously, my feet were the only part of me that was cold. 1460s and not snowproof. Dream big, and I'll see you next time, when I'll be going over how I made this orange and black directoire revival costume. Bonus content time!
One of the main questions you get when you're wearing a historical costume is how do you go to the bathroom in that? And a lot of times I hear people in person on the internet will explain how, for example, the Victorians coped with this problem. But the Victorians had chamber pots and other options and didn't have modern flush toilets in cubicles. As a LARPer or reenactor or anyone who is wearing Victorian, Edwardian, 18th century, it works for any big dresses, it works for wedding dresses, anyone who is wearing that in the modern day has to cope with modern toilets in confined spaces and the answer to the question how do you go to the bathroom in this is like so. You scooch everything up at the front, split leg drawers or no underpants at all, shuffle up everything up. Ta-da! Genuinely works, not had a problem in any costume I have ever made or worn, including the one that had a four metre train. When in doubt, no knickers, get on front ways. This is the kind of content you come here for.